Councilmember Mitch Brown, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilmember. Council is appreciative to have Pastor Imani Jones, a co-pastor of Advent, United Church of Christ uh, to pray with us this evening. Pastor Jones, uh, welcome to council. Welcome back to council. Thank you. Happy to be with everyone. Let us pray. Spirit of light, spirit of love, spirit of life. As we gather together at this council meeting, we invite your presence and spirit of wisdom to lead us. As our leaders discuss the issues most relevant to the residents of this great city, public safety, transportation, housing, finances, health and human services, and others, we do so asking that you will give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to be open to the needs of your people. As we gather virtually, we are ever mindful and ever aware of the reason why we must meet in this way in the first place. And we pray for those whose lives have been upended and devastated by all facets of COVID-19. We pray for a path forward that will eradicate this virus and restore health, human connection, and peace to all of us. We pray the same for the pandemic of systemic racism for all who live in fear and grief each day as a result. We pray for your path of peace alongside justice and love of neighbor to be present and serve as a guiding light during times of darkness. We pray for our leaders who govern with such passion and integrity that you will continue to be the light that guides their lives and, the, and lights their hearts. Oh God, we need you now as we have needed you always. And we invite you into this space. In your most holy name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you so much, Pastor Jones for being with us this evening. For praying over us. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Thank you, Madam Clerk. May I get a motion to dismiss with the reading of the journal? So moved. Second. Thank you. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Faber, Mimi, Tyson, President Harvey. This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be ran to the record? Yes, President Harden, members of council, one additional item this morning or this afternoon is the report of the assessment equalization board. I will read uh, the report as follows. To the council, city of Columbus, Ohio, the undersigned and assessment equalization board appointed and acting pursuant to city of Columbus ordinance 70X-2020 passed by Columbus City Council on the 18th of May, 2020, respectfully submit the following as our report related to the estimated assessment for the 5th and 4th Street Special Improvement District of Columbus Incorporated. Motion number one, in the case of residential objectors, Brady and Carr, Brophy, Das, Geraldo, Frank, Mata, Patel, Robinson, Schmolsky, and Geber, and Underwood, the board recommends their assessment be reduced by 50%. Votes were two in favor, one opposed. Motion number two, the board recommends that council Identify property owners within the SID who are similarly situated as the objector as the objectors, i.e., residential property owners who pay into homeowner associations 
that may provide similar services and consider reducing their assessment by a similar amount to motion number one. Votes were two in favor, one abstention. Motion number three recommends that no assessment adjustment be made for the commercial property objectors on file. Votes were three in favor. Signed, Matthew Adair, member, Dave Paul, member, Autumn Glover, member, dated October 9th, 2020. And that is all. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any resolutions by members of council? Uh, starting with President Pro Tem. That's from me. Thanks, Council President. Thank you. Councilman Mitch Brown. Uh, Councilmember Jones. Uh, no resolutions tonight, Council President, but just my weekly reminder for folks that are watching to request their absentee ballot if they are uh, thinking of voting by mail this year. Um, you can go to columbus.gov slash vote to request that form. Uh, also, City Council and a lot of our staff will be out at multiple locations this Saturday from 9 to noon, uh, handing out absentee ballot request forms and returning those at the Board of Elections uh, to make sure that if folks are interested in voting with that option this year, that uh, those forms are readily available in the community. So we'll be announcing more details on sort of where we'll be in the city on social media over the next few days. Uh, so please, folks, pay attention to their Twitter and Facebook to make sure that if you're interested in meeting up with council this weekend to get a form that you can do so. Uh, and with that, Council President, that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you again for leading our Vote Safe Columbus uh, initiative. Uh, council Member Faber. Not at this time. Thank you, Council Member Reen. I don't have a resolution, but I also want to share um, um, share with our viewing and listening audience about our flu shot clinics. And again, um, we had one on Saturday. It's again, it's in the loop, the loop drive at Columbus Public Health at 240 Parsons Avenue from 9 to 3. And it will be also, so we had one on Saturday. We had 297 people um, come and get a, get a flu shot. And we also had 57 individuals who got Narcan. Um, so today through the 16th, you can also go to Columbus Sciota High School, 2951, um, South High Street, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 3 this week, and Thursday, Tuesday, and Thursday from noon to 6. Then next Saturday, the 17th, Saturday, the 24th, and Saturday, the 31st, you can also receive flu shots again at Columbus Public Health, 240 Parsons Avenue. And um, also on the 20th, Oh, I'll say that later, but on the 19th through the 23rd, Briggs High School, you can also get uh, flu shots. And then also the 27th and the 28th, you'll be able to get them at the community center um, of the city of Worthington. And that's all I have in terms of my announcements this week. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Tyson. I only have one uh, resolution this evening. It's uh, resolution number 0153X-2020, and it's to honor and recognize October 12th as Indigenous Peoples Day uh, in the city of Columbus. I was talking with a friend after protest, uh, and he said something that stuck with me. He said, America has two original sins, slavery and the genocide of Indigenous people. It's important, it's impossible to think about a more just future without reckoning with these original sins from our past. This resolution today is to acknowledge Native people's many contributions to our nation, culture, to our social and our political development. Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in 1977 by a delegation of Native nations to the UN's International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous People in the Americas. We know that in Central Ohio, uh, the traditional is the traditional homeland of the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte and other indigenous nations. Council recognizes that colonizers forcibly removed native peoples from their land and committed acts of genocide. Council is choosing to recognize Native American history, legends, art, and names are interwoven into the spirit and fabric of our nation's uh, 
history. At this point, I'd like to invite Mr. Ty Smith, Rector at the Native American Indian Center of Central Ohio, to say a few words. Mr. Smith, welcome to Council. Um, Smith, I think you're still muted. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Welcome to Council. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. And, uh, you know, I want to extend a warm thank you to each and every member of uh, City Council here in Columbus. And, uh, you know, I want to give uh, a shout out to Stanley, too. You know, he was uh, really gracious and he was really, uh, you know, just uh, nice to work with in terms of talking and just kind of like bringing me up to speed with uh, the intentions that uh, you, the the members here of City Council and uh, as well yourself, President, I thank you for uh, the invitation and uh, the acknowledgement. And, uh, you know, I I sit here and I try to think of the words that I can say. And, uh, you know, I think there's a few things that I should say up front. You know, I do want to uh, acknowledge just the way that you have, you know, the, the leadership in Indian country that has uh, stood forth before me and uh, really kind of, uh, you know, help pave and shape the way that uh, things are developing and, and us coming to this day to uh, to now talk in this in this kind of language, you know, to in behalf of, you know, the, the past and, uh, you know, looking at the present as well and looking to the future. But, um, you know, I feel that this is a very significant time and, uh, you know, we're, we're happy that you guys would uh, make such a bold decision, you know, and, uh, you know, when it comes to our people in terms of, um, you know, the, the size and how many of them, how many of us there really are, especially in a state like Ohio, you know, we, we are less than 1%. And so it's, uh, it's encouraging when people at the leadership level, you know, advocate and step up, you know, on our behalf, because sometimes we ain't always at the table, nor do we have a voice, you know, in, in uh, certain circles. But, um, the gesture is very well uh, appreciated. I know I probably speak for a number of people in Indian country, and uh, you know we're um, we're hopeful because there has been uh, a past, you know, littered with you know countless traumas, and you know we can. I think we're all grown up to to you know have learned enough about those histories, but uh, the aftermath, though, of intergenerational historical trauma has definitely uh, taken its toll on a, a number of people, you know, and, you know, the, the group of us as minorities in this country. So with this point in time, you know, we want to say that, you know, we're, we're thankful. We, we are appreciative. And, um, you know, I want to say this, too, and I, and I forgot to introduce myself, you know, in the beginning. Uh, I'm a tribally enrolled member from the Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon, and I grew up there. The first half of my life and uh, I know what it is you know to live you know in Indian country but the second half of my life I've come to live out here in the urban setting and I've uh, I've come to find a newfound respect for the plight the just the the life that we live you know that uh, what we refer to ourselves as as city Indians and this is just kind of common terminology in Indian country but we're those that live in the urban environment and uh you know it's it's um again it's encouraging to have a moment like this you know declared and a change in in name and uh you know historically making a point to you know now acknowledge something and uh with that said you know i think there has to be uh acknowledgement given too as well just as you said president that uh you know there are those that were formerly here the original native peoples of this land you know and i do want to take time and just here mention their names as well you know in recognition and understanding that we are on their homelands and so the people that you see here today in in columbus central ohio ohio uh and even the surrounding states a lot of us are by way of other tribes and other areas and I give mention to that because a lot of the work that we do here at the at the Native American Indian Center of Central Ohio, and we say NACO for short, is really trying to find a way to, to make a difference in their lives so that uh, it really can count for something. And uh, again, today is a, a, a really feels like a turning point in the healing journey that we're on. And so I want to thank you all again, you know, for, for making time and, you know, making this a uh, significant moment here. But uh, I do want to as well say that, you know, I want to encourage and even ask and, you know, and put an invitation out there as well to say that we can change the name of a, of a day. We can, we can acknowledge that there are native people here, but 
we have to think too, what can we do? And so I want to ask you as leadership, and I want to invite you, you know, to see who we are, see who your native people are here today in Columbus. And with that said, you know, I would like to think that maybe we could try to find a way to work together for the betterment of the native people that we serve here at NACO and uh, try to find a way to, to make this journey, you know, even more successful, even better along the way for, for all that are involved, you know, and find a way that um, we can learn how to coexist. And, uh, and a big part of what we struggle with is uh, a sense of invisibility and, uh, and disconnect. And uh, we have a lot of great, wonderful initiatives that we've been doing here at NACO. And I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't uh, give a commercial to today. And we mark this day as well uh, to, to launch our mobile food trailer. And uh, we're calling it NACO Cuisine. And our uh, specialty is Native American street food. We're open today from 2 to 7. And uh, we'll be here as well to, uh, the next following Saturdays. But uh, in that, you know, there's an underlying campaign and there's a lot of initiative to what we're doing that speaks to the mission work in behalf of our people here at NACO. And so, again, I would just want to say that, you know, I'm thankful that this kind of decision has been made. Uh, this resolution has been passed and is going forward. But I would urge you all too to not think of this as just a one and done type of moment. And I would encourage you guys to really get to know who your native people are here. And with that said, and as the project director here at NACO, I'd like to in extend an invitation to you all as leadership to, uh, to come and see who we are and see who your native people are here in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Uh, I know that we'll, we'll, we will take you up on that. Uh, would you give us the address for the uh, food truck uh, for this week and those times again? Okay, the address will be 67 East Innes Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43207. And then the hours from the next three Saturdays of this month will be from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then our our schedule for November is still tentative. We've been invited to some different places, so we're still trying to figure out what that really looks like. But for right now, we know that we will be here for the rest of the month um, at, the, at our location where our agency is. And uh, parking just alongside the streets and um, the, most people enter into the alley and come in the back way, but you'll hear the music, you'll see our trailer. Uh, we have tribal flags that are flying on top of it, so we shouldn't be hard to miss. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? To recognize just this, uh, just briefly, Council President. Please, please. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Mr. Smith for being here, for uh, speaking up and speaking out, um, and also for the the invitation, which we will all surely take you up on. Um, I, I think it's, this is a, a critical resolution. I really appreciate you, Council President, for um, introducing it today. Um, as, as we in the city of Columbus um, try to do better, um, quite simply, and uh, the we we have to um, celebrate and recognize Indigenous people and, and um, their contributions to this country, and you know our efforts to do so uh, are are critically important to making sure that every member of our community uh, feels seen. Um, so thank you for reminding us of that, Mr. Smith. I think that's um, absolutely important and. And um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Seeing no further uh, questions or comments on my resolution, uh, may I have a, uh, a move for adoption? Second. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardy. The resolution is adopted. Thank you again, Mr. Smith. Uh, are there any comments by our elected officials? See our uh, auditor. Hi, Mother, how are you? I'm fine, sir. Council President, just one brief comment. Next Monday, the 19th, we'll be releasing our 2021 revenue estimate. And so I'll be happy to um, spend any time. I know I have an upcoming meeting with Finance Chair Brown. I'm happy to talk more with you after the it's published. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Sure. Madam Treasurer. 
city attorney's office. Um, before we get into legislation, I'd like to note, um, as we do uh, beginning of council, uh, how many deaths we've seen in the past week due to COVID. As of today, there have been 484 deaths in our jurisdiction due to COVID-19. That's three, three more of our neighbors since our last meeting a week ago um, that are no longer with us. Um, the number has come down. I'm grateful for that, but those are three members, three parents, three children, uh, three aunts and uncles who are no longer with us. So I encourage folks to continue to take this seriously, to wear your mask, um, especially as football season approaches. Wear your mask in public places uh, and keep that six feet of distance. Are there uh, any requests by members of council for the removal of ordinance on the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will the clerk now read to the record the order's numbers of number of 30-day legislation mm -hmm. on this agenda. Finance Committee, Ordinance 2212-2020, Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 2333-2020. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 2139, 2187, 2193, 2195, and 2207-2020. Economic Development Committee Ordinance 2234-2020. Zoning Committee Ordinances 2009, 2010, 2240, 2241, and 1972-2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, would you do me an assist? Are there any speakers on uh, this portion? All right. Uh, the following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent action. Will the clerk now read those ordinance numbers into the record? Resolution of Expression 152X-2020 Finance Committee, Ordinance 2088, 2109, 2121, 2174, 2175, 2196, 2213, 2226, and 2227-2020, Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinance 2053, 2064, and 2244-2020, Public Safety Committee, Ordinances 2177, 2209-2020, Veterans and Senior Affairs Committee, Ordinance 1412-2020, Public Utilities Committee, Resolution 140X-2020, Ordinances 2032, 2067, 2072, 2078, 2110, 2119, 2152, 2167, 2179, 2241, and 2246-2020, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Resolution 141X-2020, Ordinances 2135-2153, 2231-2020, Housing Committee, Ordinance 2181-2020, Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, Ordinance 2144-2020. Um, Administration Committee, Ordinance 2082-2020. Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 2150, 2178, 2186, 2190, 2192, 2217, 2220, and 2222 2020 Small and Minority Business Committee, Ordinance 2308-2020. Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0103, 104, 105-2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Another assist. Do we have any speakers on the consent? No, sir. May I uh, have a motion? Uh, seeing no questions or comments about uh, this portion of the agenda, may I have a, uh, approval of these items designated as consent? So moved. Second. Is that by voice? Uh, yep. Yeah. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Brown? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, except for uh, 1412, on which I am abstaining. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Reeves? Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Hart? Yes. Uh, consent uh, agendas uh, are passed with a no exception. 
We will now go into, um, we'll proceed with the second reading, uh, our 30 day portion of the agenda. The first committee to come before council is the Recreation and Parks Committee. That committee is chaired by President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Um, tonight, we have one ordinance in Recreation and Parks to authorize, uh, it's Ordinance 2050 2020 to authorize and direct the city auditor to establish an auditor certificate in the amount of 450,000 for various expenditures for professional architectural engineering and construction management services in conjunction with park trail and facility capital improvement projects to authorize the director of the recreation and parks department to enter into multiple future professional service contracts to tr authorize the transfer of 450,000 within the recreation and parks voted bond fund to authorize the amendment of the 2019 capital improvements budget to authorize the expenditure of 450,000 from the recreation and parks voted bond fund to waive the competitive bidding provisions of columbus city code and declare an emergency this ordinance will create uh, significant efficiencies within the recreation and parks department by pre-qualifying 25 firms to provide architecture and engineering services and six firms to provide construction management services on projects costing less than $100,000. This program allows the department to quickly respond to capital needs at city parks, trails, and facilities to ensure they remain accessible, safe, updated, and user-friendly. For each project, there will be a competitive process amongst the pre-qualified firms in lieu of separate legislation to approve individual contracts similar to current practice for certain public service projects. This ensures that we are using tax do taxpayer dollars efficiently uh, and effectively despite waiving the competitive bidding provisions that would be required if each project were approved through a separate ordinance. An added benefit is the ability for the Recreation and Parks Department to directly engage with MBE certified firms who are pre-qualified to work on projects. Emergency action is being considered so that the maintenance of Recreation and Parks facilities can continue throughout this program uninterrupted. Are there questions from colleagues? Hearing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll, thank you. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. That's uh, all I have in my committees, Council President. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Public Safety Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Council President, uh, this evening I have ordinance 2073 to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer five million. $755,447.03 from the Special Income Tax Fund to the Fire Safety Bond Fund to authorize the appropriation of said funds to waive the competitive bidding and sale of surplus provisions of the Columbus City Codes, Chapter 329, to authorize the Finance and Management Director to enter into contracts and issue purchase orders to Sutphin Corporation for the purchase of five Monarch Custom Rescue Vehicles in the amount of $3,836,685, heritage fire equipment for the uplift of an existing rescue in the amount of $62,274.58, Finley fire equipment for the purchase of one Pierce tiller ladder and intercom retrofit in the amount of $1,444,067.43, how rescue system for the purchase of extraction rescue tools in the amount of $244,510 in accordance with the social provisions of city codes. Motorola Solutions Inc. for the purchase of communications equipment in the amount of $27,910.02 and all American fire equipment for the purchase of thermal imaging cameras in the amount of $140,000 to amend the 2019 capital improvement budget to authorize the expenditure again of five million seven hundred fifty five thousand forty four four hundred forty seven dollars and three cents from the safety voted bond fund and to declare an emergency also present is deputy director george speaks who will speak to the issue of competitive waiver the waiver of competitive bidding and the process and purchase of this apparatus for our new fire station Director Speaks, the floor is yours, sir. 
Thank you, Council Member Brown, members of Council. Uh, the reason we are asking for competitive bidding to be waived is a recent change in state guidelines. Uh, first, let me underscore that all the apparatus and equipment is on state term contract. And as you know, that generally does not have to be competitively uh, bidding waived when it's on state term contract. After this ordinance was submitted, there has been a change in state guidelines. The new instruction from the state of Ohio is that one should still seek uh, three additional bids, even if an item is on state term. So in the future, uh, we would not be uh, asking for a waiver like this. Rather, in the future, we would look at an item under state term, also look at other items on state terms to see additional uh, bids. But again, due to the very recent change uh, in the way the uh, waiver of the uh, state term contract um, has been proposed, uh, we wanted to proceed to get these vehicles as expeditiously as possible. Again, let me underscore that all the vehicles and apparatus are on state term contract. Director Speaks, could you also speak to the issue of what we do with the older equipment? Sure, well, first let me uh, go back a step. The reason we're purchasing uh, these new equipment is our division of fleet does a wonderful job of looking at both the years of service life and the amount of uh, miles put on each vehicle, and then they come up with a replacement schedule. So for example, you had mentioned the replacement of the rescue vehicles. Those were purchased in 2012. They have significant miles. For example, rescue 16 has 156,000 miles on it. Um, once uh, the vehicles are set to retire, uh, there is an auction. That auction is again administered by our fleet uh, management uh, system, and it's uh, we take bids from uh, around the country for our older apparatus. If there are no additional questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Joanne, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you, Director Speaks. Also, uh, Council President, I have uh, Ordinance 2106 2020 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety to enter into a contract with the Research Foundation of the City University of New York on behalf of the criminologist David Kennedy and the National Network for Safe Communities at John Jay College to assist the city in serious violence prevention to authorize the transfer of 80,000 within the general fund and to authorize the expenditure of $80,000 from the general fund to waive competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. Again, Director Speaks. Uh, thank you, Council Member Brown, members of Council. Uh, let me start out with saying that criminologist David Kennedy is among the nation's most respected consultants in the field of modern policing and has been so for over 20 years since the mid-1990s when he was the architect of Boston's Operation Ceasefire, uh, which is often called Boston's Miracle. Uh, he co-founded the National Network, which utilizes law enforcement working with the community to improve public safety, to minimize arrest and incarceration. Uh, this group is very highly acclaimed for all the work they've done around the country and has received numerous awards through the years. Uh, this contract will enlist their unique services uh, to provide some st strategic advising and technical assistance to combat serious violence, especially gun violence. Uh, they will be analyzing our crime data, meeting with our police officers, our detectives, our crime analysts, reaching out to probation departments. They will then utilize their unique qualitative and quantitative analysis to map out gang relationships. Uh, this will assist law enforcement and social service providers in knowing where and to whom to best direct precious resources. Um, so specifically, the purpose of this contract is, is for Kennedy's group to help us identify not only who the group is, but who within that group is most likely to commit violence and who is directing the violence within that group. This effort will complement and build upon other initiatives within our comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy, such as our apps program, our violent crime review group, and our safe neighborhoods initiative. In fact, our safe neighborhoods initiative is modeled after Mr. Kennedy's work. Uh, please recall the genesis of this initiative several years ago was the Bread Organization who brought this wonderful initiative to us. 
uh, the focus on safe neighborhood is on violent offenders who are on probation and who have been deemed to be at risk to reoffend to commit another violent act. Uh, these folks are ordered into a session of the Court of Common Pleas where they are exposed to various perspectives from family members of who's had folks killed by gun violence, uh, by the clergy, they are spoken with by medical professionals, by police, by a criminal defense attorney, and by city, county, and federal prosecutors. Participants in this initiative are then offered significant social services, workforce development resources through such groups as Alvis 180 Degree Impact, the Columbus Urban League, and the Franklin County Probation Department, uh, amongst many other providers. These resources are offered to provide an alternative from a path of crime and violence. Um, however, they are also made a promise that we're watching them. And should they be involved in another gun crime, they will be prosecuted to the maximum extent provided by law, particularly federal law where gun specifications are far more draconian than under the Ohio Revised Code. We have had very good results with this program in terms of the individual participants, uh, in terms of them not reoffending. Uh, and by enlisting the assistance of Mr. Kennedy and the National Network, we hope to expand this impact from the individual participants to the broader circle of their associates. Uh, most importantly, are the associates who are most apt to commit violent crime and the leaders who are directing the violent crime. Uh, in summary, we respectfully recommend passage of this contract which will be another piece of our overall comprehensive safety strategy and will help to underscore our message to stop the violence. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, three speakers this evening. Are there any questions from my colleagues before I have uh, the speakers uh, address this issue? Councilmember, I have a question. I don't know if you think it'd be better to go yes. now or uh, after you were speaker. Um, I, I'm open, Council President, whichever way you wish to handle it. Well, I'll just go, go real quick. The question I have, uh, really uh, excited about this piece of legislation. I think, you know, we started programs like the APPS program 10 years ago. Uh, we saw that spike in crime. We wanted to get to um, uh, to make sure that we were having the, the touches out in the streets uh, to, to divert and, and give other options. And I think that we have several different programs now that have grown since 2010 uh, in this space. My question more director speaks is to the, the, uh, the, the systems work of all of those. How are these things working together? How are they talking to one another? Um, and how, by adding this additional layer to that, um, are, are we uh, making sure that, that we're actually uh, moving in the right direction? Sure. Uh, thank you, Council President. Let me say that where this group has been contracted with in other cities, they have seen significant reduction uh, in violent crime. It, and I hope to see the same here. However, I, I don't want to set expectantly high expectations because if you said we already have in place a number of initiatives that cities who've experienced a big drop by engaging in this group, um, they didn't have those initiatives that we have in place. You had mentioned our wonderful apps program. Uh, we have the violence interveners, our safe neighborhood program, our violent crime group. Uh, who was addressing crime holistically. Um, all of these uh, are, are coming together to address violence. I think this adds another significant component to that multifaceted way to address uh, violence. So while I certainly cannot say we're gonna have the same dramatic drop in crime by the engagement of uh, Dr. Kennedy and the national network, I can say that I'm very excited and hopeful that this effort will result uh, in significantly less violence, and, and particularly gun violence. It, it, in some, we're adding another significant uh, initiative to what we already have. Thank you. Director Speaks, do you have a timeline with regards to being able to come back to this council to give some uh, update on the progress with regards to this particular program? Uh, I would love to. Uh, this particular contract will take approximately six months. So uh, first quarter next year, I would love to come and brief council on the results. Thank you. Uh, oh, I see, yes, Chip, Chip Tyson. I think it's in her favor, but I'll go after her. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, so just a, a brief question, which is a half step off of uh, Council President Harden's question. Obviously, uh, in ju different uh, jurisdictions are going to demand um, a different mythology for different areas. Um, and you know what may work in uh, um, on on the hilltop might not work in Linden. So uh, will this group be able to uh, kind of triage and then adjust accordingly? Um, we're not getting a one-stop shop approach to to ending gun violence, right? No, no, no. Again, the, the the purpose of this contract is is for lack of a better way to describe it, uh, gang or group mapping. It will it will, it will show where are the folks who are committing violent crimes? What are those groups? What are the connections? Who are the leaders in that group? And then that is where law enforcement and social service agencies can then dedicate their precious resources. So that'll be a citywide effort. Gotcha. And that will be complementary to the, the gang unit already? Uh, ab absolutely. The gang unit will be very involved in, in terms of helping to identify uh, those folks. So there will be both looking at uh, various data points regarding crime data. Secondly, they'll be in the field, uh, working with our gang unit, our homicide folks, uh, the probation departments. Uh, again, discerning who are the leaders of violence in the city. Studies have shown that a, a few people drive the great majority of violence. This gets at those few people. Gotcha, thank you. Councilman Tyson. Thank you, Chairman, Chair, Council Chair Brown. I'm excited about this work. I mean, we need every tool in the tool chest to be able to help us to um, to work with our community to deal with violence. And I'm just really pleased that um, that we will also, as stated, have to be working with the social service agencies because typically, when individuals are involved in a violent crimes, there um, we can look at the social determinants of health what has happened to the individuals and how do we help to provide some resources to them and the fam and their family. So I appreciate that aspect um, of this work. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, I have three speakers, um, a Mr. Jonathan Broner. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. All right. Uh, uh... Thanks very much, uh, Council President and Council Members. Uh, my name is John Groner. Uh, I'm a member of Congregation Tefereth Israel. Uh, I've been a member of BREAD for a number of years. Uh, my daytime job, I'm a pediatric surgeon. I directed the trauma program at Nationwide Children's Hospital for over two decades. Uh, I'm also a professor of surgery at Ohio State University College of Medicine. Uh, these opinions are mine, don't necessarily reflect Nationwide Children's Hospital policy. Uh, on a typical day at Nationwide Children's Hospital, I take care of kids who have been injured in car crashes or falls or playing sports. But since the pandemic began in March, we have seen a surge in the number of kids getting shot. In fact, if you compare 2020 with the same period in 2019, the number of children with firearm injuries has roughly tripled. We've seen terrible injuries and a number of deaths. Uh, the last time I was on call, I took care of a kid who relocated to Columbus because his family thought it was safer than the other city he lived in. And he was shot in the leg and required many hours in the operating room to repair the damage. I would also add, since I wrote these words on Saturday, two more young people in Columbus have died from gunfire. Uh, this is just from news reports, one at Ohio State and one a couple of blocks from where I'm sitting right now. Um, it is clear to me that adding more police officers, more technology, and even more arrests will not decrease the number of children getting shot. Uh, what is needed is a new approach that brings together law enforcement and social services in the community with a common goal of reducing firearm injuries and saving lives. That's why I'm here to support the contract with the National Network for Safe Communities. The NNSC approach is supported by published scientific research and has demonstrated effectiveness in many United States cities. The NSC approach brings together law enforcement agencies, social services, and the community with a common message in a unified deterrence strategy. This approach strengthens police legitimacy, which is critically important in reducing violence. The cost of fire and violence in Columbus is huge. Shootings not only result in healthcare costs and lost income, they also devastate neighborhoods and force businesses to move away. It is estimated that preventing a single Columbus shooting 
roughly save the amount of money that the NSC, NNSC program costs. Because I'm a pediatric surgeon, I often have difficult conversations with families. Of all the difficult conversations I have with families after tragedy, by far the most difficult is talking to a family after a child's been killed by gunfire. It is so senseless and so painful that a child who is healthy, smiling, and full of life an hour ago is now lying lifeless in the trauma room, often covered in blood, all because of, bullet, of a bullet smaller than my fingertip. I would be grateful if I never had to have this conversation again. So I'm asking city council, please support this NNSC program. It could reduce the number of children killed by guns in Columbus. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Dr. Groner, thank you for your work in the community. Uh, I'm very sensitive to the issue involving gun violence. I will tell you that certainly working with Director Speaks and public safety and our law enforcement officers, uh, we will have to take a look at what we can do to try and adjust the issue of gun violence. Uh, gun violence is up around the country, not only in our city, unfortunately, and we're looking for all sorts of ways to try and minimize the potential danger and damage that done to especially to young people. Um, with that, I also have uh, a speaker, uh, Mr. Don Brown. Mr. Brown, would you please state your name? You have three minutes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, I do not see Don Brown listed as an attendee. Thank you, Angie. Uh, also, we have a Mary Counter. You can hear me now? I'm yes, Mary you can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council President and Council Members for the opportunity to speak about this ordinance, which will bring the National Network for Safe Communities years of expertise to our wounded community in Columbus. Five years ago, and then last year, gun violence came up as a problem we as a community want to seek solutions for. In our initial research, we found targeted and focused group violence intervention is a possible way to reduce homicides dramatically. Many on the BREAD research team read the book, Don't Shoot, by David Kennedy. David Kennedy originally started this work in the 90s, we have watched the strategy evolve to bring more legitimacy, trust, and reconciliation between law enforcement and this extremely small but violent group of about 1% of the entire community. In 2017 and 2018, the Columbus Department of Public Safety, the U.S. Attorney, Adult Probation, the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas and Prosecutor, a local defense attorney, social services agency, Clergy and the community worked a modified targeted intervention with two groups of individuals. These individuals were determined to be at high risk to commit another violent offense. This meeting, commonly known as a call-in, sends a message to these individuals that the violence must end. In exchange, the individuals get the opportunity to change their life of violence with the service support they need. Results proved, if there were any doubters, that the solution of sending a consistent message and following through on the message with action can succeed. In our second round of research, we found that those who worked as partners in this Safe Neighborhoods Initiative felt it was effective and wanted more of the same. The amount of commitment and willingness to work together, and in fact, the interest in continuing the work impressed me. What potential we would have if we advanced strategy forward with more resources. Now is the time to implement the group violence intervention strategy fully in Columbus. Our community needs this new approach to reducing gun violence. We will be saving lives and millions of taxpayer dollars by staying on course and being transparent with an admission that we care and we want a new start in the community. We stand ready to help a young person leave the life of fear and trauma behind. I'm a mom with a son and grandchildren. I want to be a good ancestor. My white privilege has deprived some in my community of dignity, healing, and resources. It is time to restore those things. Let us start to address the public health crisis of racism with a proven strategy to build safer community. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Uh, no questions for you, Ms. Connor. I appreciate your advocacy. Um, we realize, certainly the folks in public safety and our law enforcement agencies, 
that gun violence is a serious, serious problem. Um, they will take multiple ways to try and address this concern. Uh, certainly, um, when you heard from Dr. Groner about the ER having to deal with gun violence, especially when it involves children, um, we don't have an in there's no easy answer for it, but I can assure you that this council is looking at different ways in which we can try to minimize gun violence. So thank you for your advocacy. Um, uh, Councilman Tyson. Yes, Councilman Brown. I just want to add one other statement. I, and I made this, I mean, I don't know, maybe a month ago. But, um, you know, gun violence certainly has been a concern in urban communities for a while. The numbers have been going down in, in, in some areas. But, we, but right now, and I think that Dr. Groner hit on this, but I really want to make sure that I'm stating this. A lot, um, many urban communities right now are dealing with increased gun violence due, since COVID. Mm -hmm. Increased gun violence because of COVID. This is all across the country in urban cities. And that's because communities already, we were dealing with um, challenges already in communities. And I, again, around the social determinants of health. And then when you add what's going on right now in terms of um, race and equity in our communities and what people, you know, what, what's being, what's happening in our communities around the, you know, George Floyd's, Breonna Taylor's, all of that stress, plus you add the pandemic to it, and people are having to be with, you know, kind of pin up in their homes, that they're not able to get out and have, you know, kind of in, using their energy in other ways. And then the overall just stress of where we are right now. And Dr. Roberts and I had this conversation earlier. We cannot minimize what's going on in people's lives. Loss of jobs, family members getting COVID. There's a lot of things going on in our community that also, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a lot for um, a person that is already in a stressful situation and if they own a gun to be involved in activities of gun violence. So this legislation is important, but I don't wanna minimize, you know, a lot is going on in our community right now that young people are dealing with and, and they're obviously not reacting in, in the best way possible, but those are things that are happening too. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Tyson. Director Speaks, would you have any comments, sir? No, I certainly underscore everything that Councilmember Tyson said. I would also add in the unemployment rate, I think it's a huge factor also. Thank you. Uh, and I will say to my council colleagues, I know the council president discussed with me uh, in the past, and we're looking at some legislation uh, with regards to uh, guns uh, and something we'll be looking at into the future. So thank you very, very much. With that, I move for passage. Okay, please follow Ron. Brown. Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson. Yes. Council President, I, may I move on to veterans Please. and senior affairs? In veterans and senior affairs, I have 2325-2020 to authorize the Columbus City Council to enter into a grant agreement with the Ohio State University College of Social Work in support of increasing our capacity to recover program to authorize the transfer of appropriations and expenditure of 165000 within the CARES Act Fund and to declare an emergency. This particular ordinance uh, will fund, uh, will be used as a fund and help assist senior citizens uh, throughout Franklin County, uh, through co especially in an attempt to deal with COVID-19 with the way in which the pandemic has had an impact. Three ways in particular. One, they're gonna be providing emergency preparedness kits, which include flashlights and radios and some stable food uh, for individuals. Two, technology to connect older adults through social engagements with uh, telemedicine providers. I, I'm very sensitive to that one. And three, assist older adults in navigating community services and employment opportunities. Um, this particular legislation, again, will assist seniors 
and their ability to communicate and stay on top of different issues. And especially given the fact that the winter is coming upon us to have emergency kits available to them. Uh, if there are no questions, I move for passage and I ask for a voice vote. Second. Awesome. I'm sorry. Please call the grow by voice. Ms. Brown. Abstain. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Doran. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Mr. Remy. Ms. Tyson. Yes. President Harden. Yes, ordinance is passed. Council President, that's all I have in uh, Veterans Affairs this evening, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next committee to come before council is the Public Utilities Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilmember Dorrance. Councilmember Dorrance, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Tonight in the Public Utilities Committee, we have orders number 2068-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter in a construction contract with Elford Inc. For the Parsons Avenue Water Plant HVAC Improvements Project to authorize a transfer and expansion of up to $8,509,871.85 within the Water General Obligation Voted Bond Fund to provide for the payment of prevailing wage services, Department of Public Services for the Division of Water, and to amend the 2019 Capital Improvement Budget. Uh, this project will provide HVAC improvements at the Parsons Avenue Water Plant and will support the city's efforts in maintaining Working facilities provide adequate and safe drinking water supply. Uh, occasional improvements are necessary to re reduce uh, persistence maintenance costs and prolong the longevity of city buildings. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, and Hard. Pass. Thank you. Next, I have ordinance number 2074-2020 to authorize the director of public utilities to enter into a contract construction contract with the complete general construction company for the Cleveland Avenue Street Lighting Improvement Project in the sum of up to $933,662.85 to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,075,712.28 from the 2019 Electricity Geo GEO General Obligation Bonds Fund, and to amend the 2019 Capital Improvement Budget. Uh, it's the Div Division of Power's goal to incorporate the use of LED technology whenever practical um, because it's proven to provide significant energy and maintenance savings, which is the goal of the division um, at this time. Uh, work for this project involved construction of an underground decorative, underground decorative lighting system with 113 light poles on Cleveland Avenue from Chittenden Avenue to Hudson Street in North Linden. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance number 2107-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter in a construction contract with Danbert Inc. for the Blueprint Linden Argyle Parkwood project to authorize the appropriation and transfer of up to $3,325,471.35 from the Sanctuary Sur Reserve Fund in the Ohio Water Development Loan Fund to authorize the appropriation of up to $2,000 for prevailing wage services to the Department of Public Services within the Sanitary General Obligations Voted Bond Fund. Uh, this project will capture and treat non-point source stormwater runoff using local contractors in order to improve water quality within the receiving streams. Um, several public meetings were conducted to incorporate important stakeholder feedback into the design of the project. Um, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Pass. Thank you. We have next uh, ordinance number 2108-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter in a construction contract with Coasting Industrial Inc. for the facilities and equipment upgrades for the Whittier Street Storm Tanks Project to authorize an appropriation transfer of $7,800,000 from the Sanitary Sewer Reserve Fund to High Water Development Loan Fund to authorize the appropriation of expenditure of $7,800,000 from the Ohio Water Development Loan Fund and to authorize expenditure of up to $2,000 for prevailing wage services, Department of Public Services within the Sanitary General Obligation Voted Bond Fund. Um, this project will extend the life and functionality of the Whittier Street Control House, Storm Sewer, Control Gates, and Electrical Systems. 
The gates uh, present at the control house facility are important to the effective operations of the sewer system and the wastewater treatment plants. The rehabilitation of the control house facility and equipment will ensure its continued reliable operation in, in the control of the sewer system. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance number 2128-2020 to authorize the director of public utilities to enter in a construction contract with Danbrook Inc. for the Arrington Court Area Water Line Improvement Project, the amount of up to three million eight hundred fifty-two thousand seven hundred fifty-four dollars and thirty-five cents, to encumber two thousand dollars for prevailing wage services from the Department of Public Service, to authorize the appropriation transfer of up to three million nine ninety-seven thousand one hundred twelve dollars and eighty-three cents from the Water uh, System Reserve Fund to the Water Supply Revolving Loan Account Fund, to authorize the appropriation transfer of. Three million ninety-seven thousand one hundred twelve and eighty-three cents within the water supply revolving loan fund to authorize an expenditure of up to two thousand dollars within the water general obligation voted bond fund for the division of water to authorize the expenditure of up to seven hundred fifty-five thousand six hundred forty-one dollars and fifty-two cents from the streets and highways bond fund for the Department of Public Service and to authorize an amendment to the 2019 capital improvement budget. The goal of this project is to replace or rehabilitate the existing water lines in this section of, of the Northland area that have a high break frequency. Replacement of these water lines will improve water service, decrease burdens on water maintenance operations, and reduce water loss. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hurd. Thank you. Finally, we have uh, ordinance number 2136-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify an existing professional engineering service agreement with Hatch Associates Consultants, Inc. for the Jackson Pike Wastewater Treatment Plant Facilities and Equipment Upgrades, the Whittier Street Storm Tanks Project, and to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,198,635.18 from the Sewer General Obligation uh, Bond Fund. Uh, the original intent of this project was to create a design that would fully restore the Whittier storm tanks and control house. This modification is needed for engineering services during construction to ensure that that design intent are met um, during this complex and very large construction project. This project will extend the life and functionality of the Whittier Street control house, storm sewer control gates, and electrical systems. This will help reduce the likelihood of storm overflows in water and water in basements. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Thank you. And with that, that's all I have in the Public Utilities Committee tonight. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next committee to come before Council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Faber. Council Member Lord is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance Number 2123-2020 to authorize the Chief Innovation Officer to establish a purchase order with Physicians Care Connection relative to the Smart Columbus Prenatal Trip Assistance Project for services provided, to waive the provisions of competitive bidding in Columbus City Code, to authorize an expenditure of up to $26,540 from the Street Construction Maintenance and Repair Fund for the project, and to declare an emergency. Emergency. The prenatal trip assistance project aims to address Columbus's high infant mortality rates by connecting pregnant women without reliable transportation to dependable, timely, and safe rides to doctor's appointments and pharmacies. Physician's Care Connection operates step one for healthy pregnancy. Step one is the centralized intake and referral for women who need assistance with prenatal appointments and resources. Director Stevens, can you address the waiver of competitive bidding, please? Yes, thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of Council. We're respectfully requesting waiving competitive bidding because Step 1, as a partner of Celebrate 1, already provides assistance to pregnant women and has a system in place to provide support. The goal was to drive expectant mothers to use Step 1 because of the many ways it provides assistance so they would be connected with all the pregnancy resources they need. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director. Are there any questions or comments uh, by my colleagues? 
Yes, Council Member Brown. No, I'm oh. finished. Thank you. Great. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hardy. Pass. Thank you. Council President, that's all I have in uh, public service. May I move on to housing? Please. Uh, tonight in housing, we have ordinance 2171-2020 to create the Northeast Community Reinvestment Area and to authorize real property tax exemptions as authorized by sections 3735.65 to 3735.70 of the Ohio Revised Code. The Northeast CRA is associated with two projects from Metro Development who will, building, who will be building Woodfield Park at 240 units, 48 will be affordable units, and Victor, Victoria Manor at 480 units, of which 96 uh, will be affordable units. These two developments will include 144 units of affordable housing at 60 and 80% AMI. Thank you to Metro Development for working with our team to go above their typical levels of affordability with these projects. Director Stevens, do you have any additional comments on this CRA proposal? I do not. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions on behalf of my colleagues? Councilman Faber. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for this legislation and uh, working with the Department of Development. Uh, I appreciate what Metro, um, the commit commitment of Metro that um, to make sure that we have affordability from the 60 to 80 percent of AMI, which is desperately needed in our community. So congratulations. Thank you. And I'm happy to support this legislation. Thank you, Council Member Tyson. And We're having a bit of technical difficulty. Is there anyone else? Council President, I think we everyone lost council member favor. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh council member favor, are you, are you there? If not, we can um come back to this piece of to this committee. I don't want to leave any council member to vote. Council so, Member Mark is going to check on Council Member Favor in our office. Perfect. I, in the interim, uh, I see that we have a speaker on this piece of legislation. If it would be okay with the chair, I would go ahead and, and entertain that speaker now on this piece of legislation. Is uh, Mr. Joe Motil uh, available? Yes, Council President Harden, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Welcome to Council. Okay. Sorry about any difficulties. Oh, that's fine. Thank you for the consideration. Uh, President Hardin, Pro Tem Brown, members of City Council. The creation of the CRA reeks of the same special treatment and sole purpose of giving a favored developer a tax abatement while trying to disguise it as a tool to encourage development in another risk free area of Columbus. The CRA is similar to those given to luxury real estate developers, Wagon Brenner, for creating a CRA at the Quarry and Grandview Crossing and preferred living for the Kenny and Henderson CRA. All three are located in risk-free development areas and were established for the sole purpose of providing developers an unnecessary 15-year, 100% tax abatement for their new housing projects. Metro Parks spent $12 million of taxpayers' money to benefit the quarry development, and millions more in property taxes will be paid out by the public over the years to maintain this taxpayer-paid amenity for the developer. But virtually no property taxes will be paid by this developer and dozens of others throughout Columbus that do not pay their fair share of property taxes. The Grandview CRA is a prime real estate that is adjacent to the affluent suburb of Grandview Heights. Eastern boundary of this CRA is one and a half miles from Broad and High, and the new Confluence Village Crew Stadium project is within sniffing distance. The Kenny and Henderson CRA is a stone's throw away from Upper Arlington, which is one of the wealthiest suburbs of Columbus, with a median income of $103,000 and median property value of $338,000. The northern boundary of this proposed northeast CRA sits on the edge of Mr. Wexner's Easton development, 
an area that is saturated with the corporate offices of members of the Columbus Partnership who control economic city policy and politicians here at City Hall. Alliance data, which received an $8.5 million tax abatement and 65% 10-year city income tax exemption is only a couple blocks away. Also nearby is Abbott Labs, Huntington Bank, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, and Root Insurance, who will be going public soon and is expected to raise $6 billion with its IPO. And let's be honest, by adding the surrounding neighborhoods to this CRA is smoke and mirrors. Home values for homeowners west of Stelzer range from fifty to eighty thousand dollars and one hundred and fifteen to two hundred and fifteen thousand. These people are living paycheck by paycheck, and to think that they have twenty percent of the assessed value of their home and disposable income lying around to make a tax abated real property improvement on their homes is absurd. The new metro developments will create a stated one hundred and forty four units out of seven hundred and twenty eight units between the sixty and eighty percent NMI leaving 80% of its units unaffordable for those below these thresholds. And although I'm encouraged that there is finally a requirement in such an area at 60% AMI, more needs to be done. The 14 acres of vacant land to the immediate north of CODIT and Metro's project will undoubtedly be developed and is eligible for a 15-year 100% tax abatement. And any new housing development for that property should be earmarked as truly affordable as a truly affordable housing project at 60% AMI and below. I really feel your Ronald Reagan trickle down incentive policies continue to have an adverse impact on the working class and poor as it continues to rob much needed property tax revenues for public education and unfairly places high property taxes on homeowners and raises rents. It's time that Mayor Ginther, the city council recognized that we cannot continue to give out tens of millions of dollars in city income tax exemptions to corporate Columbus and tax abate our way out of poverty. Uh, I would appreciate if maybe Director Stevens could also give us an indication on how much property tax savings there will be for Metro's uh, new two new developments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Motel. I'm going to turn the committee back over to uh, Chairwoman Faith. Chairwoman, floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden, and uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Motil. I, I apologize to everyone. My internet just completely went all the way out. Um, and I only, I caught the tail end of Mr. Motil's comments, but Mr. Motil did attend our public hearing um, at which uh, Metro Development provided um, a breakdown of the uh, tax abatement process uh, for both projects in great detail. Uh, Mr. Motil, I would be more than happy to send that information um, over to you again, if if, it, if you um, weren't able to catch it during the hearing. Um, before I turn it over to Director Stevens, um, I will just say that, um, you know, what we're working with is uh, the city's incentive policy. Uh, currently, it's an imperfect system, uh, which I acknowledged during the hearing. Um, what I also acknowledged during the hearing is that we know that we have to go further uh, than, than where we're at right now, which is uh, a set aside of 100%, 10% uh, of the units at 100% AMI and 10% of the units at 80% AMI. This project uh, was pretty much done uh, before I was uh, ever a member of city council. Um, and so it's, um, I appreciate Metro uh, meeting me where um, I, I asked them to be um, with all due respect to, to all the work that had been put into uh, making that deal uh, become a reality. Um, and as it relates to whether or not um, individual homeowners are taking advantage of uh, the incentive uh, policy and making those improvements, um, it, it is the case that uh, individual homeowners are taking um, advantage. So I think it is unfair to say that um, homeowners are not able to uh, make improvements to, to their property um, at this time. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Director Stevens for any additional uh, comment or, or feedback. Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of Council. Uh, thank you again, Chair Favor, for your leadership to get us to an affordability level of 60 to 80 percent. Uh, as Mr. Motil rightly pointed out, this is close to one of our most significant job centers. And having the ability for those employees who are working at Easton or in downtown to afford uh, to have affordable apartments and, and mixed income neighborhoods is really critical. 
Uh, I'm going to be happy at our next uh, public hearing we have when we discuss uh, future affordable housing topics to have examples of those specific uh, residents who've taken advantage of the tax abatement uh, program and made improvements to their homes. The last thing I'd like to point out is we continue to use the CRA as a tool to encourage investment. And not only are we getting affordable housing units as part of that, but in this, these two proposed areas is going to create uh, property tax receipts in excess of over $2.9 million while the abatement's in place. So, but for this abatement, we wouldn't see this level of investment. And that investment is creating property tax um, revenue from day one. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And it, it is also helpful to um, acknowledge Director Stevens, I, I'm grateful that you uh, pointed that out, um, is that uh, when, when we're talking about abate, abatements, um, that does not mean that a property owner does not pay um, anything. Uh, we are talking about an abatement on the improved um, uh, part of the property. So it's helpful to, to continue to keep that in mind. Once again, I do not trivialize where we're at with our housing crisis. Uh, that's why you will hear me uh, talking very strongly about um, uh, our, our housing agenda and some um, pieces of legislation that we have uh, that we're working on. Um, and we're no, in no ways uh, trying to uh, abate our way over, out of our housing crisis. Um, it's going to take a strong strategy uh, and commitment from not only um, uh, our private market, uh, but our nonprofit and as well as government. So um, I look forward to continuing to work alongside um, our strong community partners and leaders like Joe Montiel uh, to uh, bring more affordable, safe, affordable housing to Columbus, Ohio. Are there any additional uh, questions or comments by my colleagues? Yes, Council President Harden. No, uh, thank you, Chair. I would just like to, to one, uh, thank you for the work that you do on this piece of legislation. As you pointed out, when we first started these conversations with the developer, um, we were not here. Um, in terms of, 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 of uh, what what um, uh, what was bring, being brought to us, um, and it was council's engagement that that uh, set out uh, got us to this point. Um, and to your last statement, I think that it, that's critically important. Um, this is just one of the tools in the toolbox. We do not put all of our eggs in an abatement policy to get us to more affordable housing, um, but it is a tool. Um, that we have right now. And I look forward to your leadership, Council Chair uh, Favor, as we explore what other tools, even new tools that we can bring to the table. Um, but as for, for this piece of legislation, it is good and it is much better than where we, where we started at. And I'm uh, proud to support it. Thank you, Council President. With that, I would uh, move for a passage. Second. Please call the roll. <clears throat> Brown, Dorans, Faber, Rooney, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Uh, and last, I have uh, ordinance number 2264-2020 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to execute any and all necessary agreements and deeds for conveyance of title of one parcel of real property held in the land bank pursuant to the land reutilization program and to declare an emergency. This land bank property is a single family structure that will be rehabilitated and eventually occupied by the homeowner. I am particularly excited about this project as it represents the land bank's first sale as part of the new owner occupied initiative. Director Stevens, can you please provide us with some additional details about the land bank's owner occupied program and how interested individuals can take part? Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council. Uh, as you said, this is the start of our pilot program uh, for the land banks owner occupied initiative. Uh, what we look where we work with the buyer on this, we require that they, as named, we require that the buyer is, uh, occupies it after they do the rehab. We provide a discount of up to 50% on the price of the property uh, to encourage them. It, it's another example, as, as you talked about earlier, how we are working to address the need for safe and affordable housing and maximize the tools that we have. And this is one where our land bank uh, team is, is willing to work with potential buyers who find lots or properties that they're interested in to make an investment in and be an owner occupant of. Thank you, Director Stevens. And you're absolutely right. This is another example of a, a tool in our toolbox. Um, and it's helping to make sure that 
Uh, we have people that who, who live in the communities uh, and they're interested in, in staying in the community uh, and also might have uh, some trades under their belt and, and want to help uh, beautify their own community. Uh, so I absolutely uh, am supportive of this program, excited about this program. Uh, and uh, look, with that, I will see if there are any questions or comments uh, on behalf of my colleagues. Yes, Council Member Tyson. I know I keep breaking in, but I'm excited about this program because um, one, you know, um, it's about also not having safe housing and affordable housing, but it's also about, you know, when you own a home, you build wealth. And we need to build wealth in our communities. And so to give individuals an opportunity to be able to um, get a, get get the property from the land bank, or, you know, remodel that property and build wealth is always important. So I'm just very pleased on this, um, all these new initiatives that we are um, we're thinking about under your leadership and um, and again, helping people to build wealth. So thank you. That's member Tyson, you you are spot on. I believe this particular property, I'm looking at you, Director Stevens, is in, located in the driving park area, uh, which has seen a lot of um, development over the past two to three years. Um, at, at some points, it has been inaccessible for many people who have lived in the community uh, to be able to purchase a property. Um, and so I'm really excited that this program um, is available to Columbus residents. Uh, Director, where can people find more information about the program? Uh, thank you, Chair Favor. The easiest way to find information is to go to uh, columbus.gov forward slash development and then find our land bank management uh, page to get more details. Thank you, Director. Uh, and with that, I'll move for passage. Council member, we have a speaker in person. Oh, my apologies. No problem. Jeez. One of my favorite people in the world, Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins is here. Mr. Wilkins. Um, I just, I, I was kind of tickled to death here. Um, could you tell me, is this going to be in place for several years with this new initiative that you do have? Is this all through the state of Ohio? I wish we had this like in London a couple of years ago, but unfortunately I had pulled up on the Franklin County Artists website, 936, and the uh, driving park, the beautiful home was built in, uh, I think 1940 square foot was, uh, 889 square feet, two bed, uh, two bedrooms, one bath, go to 1940s. Portland website, uh, 526, 2014. Uh, 2013, 2000, uh, 2017, it came a vacant abandonment. I just want to say to you, this new plan that you got through the land bank, I wish this could be through the state of Ohio all over to London, South London, so we can look at speeding up the process. Again, bringing trades, painting, electrical, plumbing back into these neighborhoods. Because like I say, that was a trade back in 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So we want to bring that back. Um, and again, I'd just like to have this in place for the next 50 years. Because we have some aging and older communities out here that still reside with some vacant homes that needs to be rehabbed and bringing some young people together and, and forming some construction group in this field. It's not through the driving park, but it's all over the state of Ohio and all points, points uh, east of Ohio, up in Cleveland. So again, I'm all for this, but again, I'd like to see this in place for more than 25 years. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, um, Mr. Wilkins. And, you know, if I had it my way, uh, we would take this program statewide. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, we only have control over Columbus at this point in time. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, this program will be in place until um, until there's no longer a land bank, which I hope, you know, is never the case. Uh, so once again, if uh, folks at home are interested, they have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to the Columbus Land Bank for additional information. You can also reach out to my office for with additional questions. Um, I would also be remiss if I did not give a shout out to um, our, our good folks over at the Land, um, land Bank, uh, John Turner and his entire team. 
who worked uh, very closely uh, with the new owner, which will be the new owner of this property uh, to navigate the process. So um, if you are new to home ownership um, or have never uh, embarked on rehabbing a property, um, please do not feel discouraged. Um, our folks uh, at the Department of Development are here to assist you along the way. Um, and with that, I'll move for passage. Second. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have. No, thank you, Madam Chair. It is now time for zoning. So may I have a motion to uh, recess? So moved. Second. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Recess. Uh, Chair Tyson, you want to roll right into it? Or you... Yes, yeah, I, I can roll right in if you like. <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you prefer. Let's let's go ahead. We don't have too many uh, for zoning, so if you don't mind, we'll, we'll go right into zoning. Okay. We okay. have a motion to convene uh, meeting number 30, um, 39. So moved. Second. Second. Please call the round. Round, round, door in favor. Remy Tyson, President. Okay. Can I get a motion to dismiss the reading of the journal? So moved. Second. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. We will now go to the zoning committee. Council Member Tyson chairs that committee. Uh, all members start on it. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertain to speaking before council on zoning and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the um, from the applicant. And on the advice of our city attorney's office, anyone here who wishes to speak for or against any council variance, including staff, must be sworn in and prior to giving testimony. We do so prior to beginning the reading of each variance um, on the agenda. So anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I have ordinance 2199-2020 to grant a variance from provisions of sections 3349.03, permitted uses 3349.04 BC, height, area, and yard regulations of the Columbus C codes for property located at 47 West 4th Avenue to permit and to, to conform an existing single unit dwelling and to permit a single unit carriage house on the same lot with reduced development standards in the I institutional district. The applicant is Matthew C. Lovett and Matthew, Ball, Matthew Bell, care of Maurice Wells. The proposed use is a single unit dwelling, um, dwellings on one lot. The C department's recommendation is approval. The Victorian Village Commission's recommendation is approval five to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Thank you. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. The next or the next ordinance, again, anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against the council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Ordinance number 2211. Dash 2020 to grant a variance from provisions of sections 3333.02 AR12, ARL, and AR1 apartment residential district use. 33, 33, I'm sorry, the number's right. I'm sorry, the number looks like it's long. It says 33, I'm sorry, guys. It looks like there's a correction, but maybe not. It says 33, I'm going to say 12. 0.49, a minimum size, minimum number of parking spaces required, 3333.09 area requirements, 3333.16 fronting, 3333.22 maximum side yard required, 
3.223 minimum side yard permitted and 3333.24 rear yard of Comacy codes for the property located at 1154 Mill Avenue and to permit two single unit dwellings on one lot with reduced development standards in the ARLG apartment residential district. The applicant is Martin. Martin, I mean, Eric Martineau, and it is again the proposed use is two single unit dwellings on one lot. The C department's recommendation is approval. Victorian Victorian Village Commission's recommendation is approval five to zero. If there are any questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, favor Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2215-2020 to resume 2546 Stelter Road, being 33.9 acres located on the southeast corner of Stelter Road and, and Kodak Road from our rural district to LARLD Limited Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Metro Development Care of Jeffrey Brown, the proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Northeast Air Commission's recommendation is approval. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Yes. Thank you. And the component, the variance that goes along with that previous legislation. Again, anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you, Jeff. Um, it's ordinance 22-2216-2020 to grant a variance from provision of sections 33 12.25 maneuvering, 33, 12.29 parking space, 33, 12.27 parking space, parking setback line, 33, 12.49 C minimum numbers of parking spaces required, 33, 33.11 ARLD area district requirements, 33, 33.18 building lines, and 33, 33.255 perimeter yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 2546 Delta Road to permit reduced development standards for the market unit residential development and the LARLD limited apartment residential district. And again, the applicant is Metro Development Care of Jeffrey Brown, Attorney Brown. The proposed use is a multi unit residential development. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Northeast Air Commission's recommendation is approval. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Call the Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. And that concludes the um, zoning agenda this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing uh, no more business come for the zoning committee, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Meeting is adjourned. Do we want to take two minutes uh, or do you want to roll, council members? I'm trying to look and see if anybody runs to the restaurant. I don't care. We can roll, but whatever people's preference. Two, two minutes. Council member, he needs to inside. Let's take it. <laughs> okay.
convene meeting number 38. So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Okay. We are back in meeting number 38. Uh, we are now at the Economic Development Committee. Councilmember Remy chairs that committee. Councilmember Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council President Harden. Tonight, I have two items in the Economic Development Community. First is Ordinance Number 2133-2020 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an Enterprise Zone Agreement with Minerva Ridge 2 LLC and TKS, TKS Industrial Company for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital expenditure of approximately $1,405,560 and the creation of 12 net new full-time permanent positions. Minerva Ridge 2 is a real estate holding company owned by Joe, Recker, Joe D. Recker and Joe W. Recker, a father and son managed team. The company was formed in 2019 and focuses on real estate solutions for heavy industry companies in Ohio and the Midwest. The records have been active in this space as a family business for generations. TKS Industrial Company, who was established in 1981, is the North American subsidiary of Takesha Limited, a publicly traded company in Japan. Currently headquartered in Troy, Michigan, TKS is part of a global Takesha group, a world leader in HVAC and paint finishing systems. Takesha specializes in large-scale industrial heating, ventilation, humidifying, and air conditioning systems for large buildings and industrial plants. TKS is a general contractor that provides turnkey paint finishing systems, including building, conveyors, process equipment, automation, and more. Minerva Ridge and TKS are proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $1,405,560, which includes $1,233,860 $1, in real property improvements and $171,700 in furniture and fixtures to expand its current manufacturing facility by approximately 15,800 square feet at 1539 Refugee Road. With this expansion, the company will be able to accommodate larger scale projects that are currently being sent elsewhere to other states. TKS will be the tenant and employer of record and enter into a long-term lease agreement with Minerva Ridge, the owner of the property. Additionally, the company will retain 60 full-time jobs with an annual payroll of approximately 3.91 million and create 12 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $686,820. The Department of Development recommends a 75% tenure enterprise tax zone of abatement on real property improvements. The Columbus City School Board of Education has been advised of this project. And this evening, we have Mark Sweeney on the line, um, Vice President of Manufacturing and Installation with TKS Industrial Company. Mr. Sweeney, are you there? Yes, I am. There he is. Welcome. Uh, right now, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Council President Arden and Council members for your interest in consideration of incentive support for TKS's proposed expansion project in Columbus. As you mentioned, TKS uh, uh, does uh, paint finishing systems for the automobile industry, and we have a very talented crew here in Columbus, Ohio, and they designed uh, these paint finishing systems we have engineers and 3d cad designers and they take thousands of parts and uh, turn them into huge modules that go onto trucks uh, that fill up these huge plants with uh, those paint finishing systems that you described um, right now we are subcontracting a lot of that work out and we would prefer to do it here and columbus is going to other states um, we've Operated in Central Ohio for 36 years. We look forward to expanding our presence here and continuing to utilize the region's talent pipeline, local manufacturing industry, and great business climate. We value the partnership and support from Columbus City, One Columbus, and Jobs Ohio. Anthony Slappy's efforts to help us explore resources and, re and solutions and quick turnaround are also truly appreciated. Thank you again for consideration of incentive support to expand Columbus on the south side of Columbus. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, Director Stevens, do you have any uh, additional comments on this ordinance? Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Ramey, members of council. We are pleased to be moving this incentive forward as an investment in our community, not only retaining 60 jobs, but the creation of 12 new jobs. I appreciate Mr. Sweeney being here tonight to tell a little bit about the story of, of that job growth, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? Thank you, Director Stevens. Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thanks so much. Next, I have ordinance number 2202-2020 to authorize the Director of Building and Zoning Services to enter into a professional services contract with Overlay LLC for building performance reporting software services to authorize the expenditure of up to $105,630 from the Development Services Fund and to declare an emergency. I'd now like to turn it over to Council Member Tyson. You're on mute, council member. Thank you, council member Remy. And as soon as I'm, I'm done with my comments, I know Director Messer will share a few and then we'll be right turn it back over to you for your for your um work that's been done in this area. So um this ordinance is a critical component to a to a successful implementation of the city's recently passed benchmarking ordinance uh, is establishing and maintaining a process for reporting and compliance. It was determined that a new software package was necessary to track submissions, aggregate data, and offer um, standard reports. And so to that end, the Department of Building and Zoning Services initiated initiated a um, RFP that was opened on June the 4th. And Overlay LLC received the highest score by the Evaluation Committee. And this legislation authorizes the building the Director of Building and Zoning Services to enter into a professional service contract with this organization. And this emergency action is requested in order to have the Climate Advisor as a resource to help implement the, report, the reporting system. And I would now like to ask Director Messer, if you'd like to make any additional comments, and then please, after your comments, um, Council, let Councilman Remy will then make his comments and hopefully move the legislation forward. Director Messer. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Tyson, President Hardin, other members of Council. Um, yeah, this is just a follow up to the legislation that was passed earlier this year, updating the code um, to allow for the benchmarking. Um, it will um, apply to commercial, industrial, and multifamily buildings that are more than 25,000 square feet. Um, this will start in 2021 uh, in June, as a matter of fact. And so um, we're excited to work with Overlay. Um, they have um, done benchmarking software in cities like Los Angeles, Denver, Boulder, St. Paul. So they have a lot of experience in this area. Um, really appreciate your support and consideration for passage, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director. Councilmember Remy. Thank you so much, Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, Director Messer. Um, this is important um, software, and we're looking forward to the implementation of it in here and how that uh, moves forward. Are there any questions or co additional comments from my colleagues this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Favor Remy Tyson, President Harden. And that's all I have for this evening in economic development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next committee, uh, final committee we've come before council is the Health and Human Services Committee. That committee is chaired by Customer Tyson. Customer, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have ordinance 2154-2020. It's to authorize the office, the office of the mayor and Columbus Public Health to enter to accept a appropriate uh, appropriate a grant from the Ohio Department of Health in the amount of $546,747 for the Ohio Equity Institute 2.0 project through September the 30th of 2021 and to authorize the expenditure of $546,747 from the city's general government grant fund and to declare an, emer an emergency. 
This project will allow the Celebrate One to focus on nine zip codes in Franklin County with the greatest potential to impact the birth outcomes of pregnant African-American women at risk for preterm and low birth weights in Franklin County. It will also cover the fetal infant mortality review uh, review community-based program that identifies local infant mortality issues and develops recommendations I'm sorry, I'm sorry and develops recommendations and initiatives to reduce infant deaths the ohio equity institute program in franklin county is a collaboration again between celebrate one in the Ohio department of health and again this program was created to address the racial disparities in maternal and birth outcomes while combating the, the biggest drivers and populations most at risk for those these negative outcomes the goal of this program is health equity which the oei teams work to achieve through targeted interventions for pregnant women the oei team of community health health workers neighborhood navigators serve pregnant women living below 200% of federal poverty level with an emphasis on African American and or black women. Participants often often have risk factors for adverse birth outcomes, including previous stillbirth, miscarriage, or premature birth, a history of abuse, or history of uh, mental health concerns. In the 2019-2020 program year, this program served 975 pregnant women addressing critical needs like the lack of prenatal care, health insurance, housing, and food. Navigators also link women with valuable resources and mental health assistance, doula care for pregnant women. The navigators work to find women in non-traditional settings like settings like food pantries, retail stores, and social media. That's how they reach them. Um, this is a, a great program, again, to help us to reduce our infant mortality and move our families forward. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2161-2020 and is to authorize the Board of Health to enter into a contract with the Ohio Expositions Commission to rent space for the multi-agency testing site in the amount of $267,750 and to authorize expenditure of $267,750 from the CARES Act Fund and to declare an emergency. The City of Columbus Public Health received funding from the United States Treasury through the CARES Act to respond to COVID-19, to our pandemic. And so based upon that, the CPH is using the portion of this funding to rent space with the Ohio Expositions this commission at the at the Ohio State Fairgrounds to hold COVID-19 testing site where, where various hospital systems are able to present to um, able to be present to administer COVID-19 tests. I'm going to ask uh, Michael Fielding if he would like to provide some additional information regarding this ordinance. Thank you, uh, Council Member Tyson, President Hardin, President Pro Tem Brown, and other council members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you briefly. This will actually help us uh, serve the public better. Um, right now, we're doing testing or specimen collection uh, here at Columbus Public Health at 240 Parsons Avenue in the front loop. We've done over 12,500 specimen collections. And that's quite a bit. But as the weather changes, uh, as things change in our environment and then enable us to continue to serve the public, uh, setting up this contract with the Ohio Expo and the Celeste Center will allow us to continue to do COVID testing, uh, working with three hospital systems, Ohio State University, Mount Carmel um, and Ohio Health um, to do COVID testing uh, in an enclosed facility um, certain amount of hours per day throughout the week. This will always also allow us to, do, to continue to do our Columbus Public Health uh, influenza vaccine. So this is a great opportunity. Um, we have the funding uh, to do it and uh, we think this would be a great uh, partnership for us to continue to move forward to uh, serve the public. 
Thank you, Michael. And again, I just want to reiterate that the flu shots will start October the 26th, Monday through Friday from 8 to 4 at 717 E17th Avenue. And again, getting the flu shot is more important than ever this year to protect, protect your health and the health of those around you during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Columbus residents can visit these drive through clinics to get a flu shot at no cost. If there are any questions about um, COVID testing, um, you can please, and the flu shot, please reach out to Beth Wilson at 614-625-8767. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Let's call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hart. Yes. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2214-2020. It's to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Franklin County Public, Public Health for the Franklin County Overdose Data um, to action project grant in the amount of $125,000 and to authorize the appropriation of $125,000 to the health department in the health department's grants fund and to declare an emergency. In July of 2020, um, the Franklin County Coroner's Office released preliminary overdose data overdose death statistics that stated 191 cases of apparent and suspected drug overdoses were reported to the Franklin County Coroner's Office for the first quarter of 2020. That is a 55.3% increase over the same period in 2019. It is suspected that illicit fentanyl is involved in over 80% of the drug overdose deaths in Franklin County, and Central Ohio continues to see an increase in drug overdose deaths in the African American and Latino communities. The CDC overdose death data grant funds will allow Columbus Public Health to, con to continue to use quant qualitative data to provide innovative interventions to the community with educational trainings and outreach to the most vulnerable populations in Columbus. While CPH at Columbus and Franklin County Addiction Plan continues to enhance their social media presence to reach those most in need, they will also continue to market market using grassroots efforts like hot cards, billboards, targeted marketing to, to specific neighborhoods. Columbus Public Health will also work with innovative technology applications to inform the community about deadly drugs, community resources for prevention, treatment, and Narcan access to be able to help uh, empower those struggling with the disease of addiction with building a positive network of support to prevent overdose and seek treatment. And again, if you um, know of someone who needs any of these resources, um, please contact a Andrea Boxel at 614-645-0803. If there are um, no questions or comments from my colleagues, I will move for passage. Second. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Doran's oh. favor, Remy Tyson, President Art. Thank you. Um, the next ordinance is 2260-2020. It's to authorize Columbus City Council to enter into contracts with multiple human service agents eight organizations to authorize expenditure up, up to $269,080 from the CARES Act fund and to authorize the payment of expenses starting March 1 of 2020 and to declare an emergency. I would now like to uh, ask Council Member Dorrance to um, provide information regarding this ordinance. Thank you, Chair Tyson. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, we all know the COVID-19 pandemic has caused unforeseen needs um, here in Columbus and certainly across the country. Uh, certainly, uh, Chair Tyson, you've talked to us a lot about the, the struggles of many of the human services agencies that are working to, to meet the needs uh, impacted by uh, folks during COVID-19 and certainly the you know, unbudgeted costs for many of these organizations. Uh, as, a result, as a result, many residents and nonprofit services providers are experiencing economic instability. Uh, we know it's all essential to invest in ways to increase those organizations' resiliency and stability, which is why I'm proud to help support tonight the Bishop Griffin Resource Center um, in their service to the homeless, the unemployed, families in transition or in crisis, and the working poor. Uh, the Bottoms Up Diaper Drive, who has delivered more than 400,000 diapers to over 50 food pantries and childcare facilities in Central Ohio, 
Um, the Central Ohio Workers Center, who fights for working people to obtain better wages and benefits. Um, and certainly during COVID, they provided a number of educational programs on worker safety and other programs to ensure workers in our city are protected during these uncertain times. Um, additionally, the coalition, the Columbus Coalition for the Homeless, who provide education, advocacy, and empowerment for un unhoused persons in our community. And finally, the Make a Day Foundation, who has expanded its focus during these times to assist unhoused persons with ongoing challenges after events regarding health, behavioral health, community, and social services. Uh, Make a Day has also established an ongoing partnership with the Franklin County Office of Justice Policy Programs to offer homeless guests access to on-site expungement, warrant removal, and peer support services, and other smart justice resources and programs, which we know are all vital towards getting people back on their feet. Uh, all these organizations are helping out most in need here in our city, and I'm certainly uh, privileged to be able to provide them some resource tonight uh, to help these organizations during these uncertain times. So with that, we'd certainly like to turn it back over to you, Chair Tyson. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dorrance, for your support of uh, nonprofit organizations during COVID. Um, if there are no questions or comments for Council Member Dorans, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, favor Remy Tyson, President Barton. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2303-2020. Um, it is to authorize Columbus City Council to enter into a grant agreements with Columbus Urban League and the Catholic Social Services in support of the Right to Recover initiative and to authorize a transfer of appropriations and expenditure within the CARES Act and declare an emergency. I would now like to turn the um, floor over to President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown to share information regarding this ordinance. Uh, thank you so much, Council Member Tyson, um, and for your leadership on human services issues and support during this time of crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting economic crisis continue to impact workers and, uh, and families in our community and across the country. Like many economic shocks, this crisis has disproportionately impacted low-income workers who can least afford disruptions in their lives. But unlike past downturns, the physical health and economic security of families are linked more directly and more inseparably than ever. In a COVID-19 economy, too many residents face the double jeopardy of low-wage jobs that require in-person work. On the one hand, showing up in person exposes them and their families to increased risk of infection. But not showing up at all means they can no longer meet a rent payment, a doctor's bill, or the costs of their child's medicine. It is in our citywide interest for every resident to have access to testing without fear of what will happen to their paychecks if they test positive. But until now, workers in low wage jobs who typically are unable to access sick pay have had no recourse to provide for themselves or their families if they are required to isolate following a positive test. This is a pressing barrier as we try to promote testing across every Columbus zip code. And it spells disaster for too many families. For, for low wage earners, a positive COVID-19 test doesn't just foretell a serious health concern but also possible, probable financial ruin. According to a July study on the impact of COVID-19 in major US cities, more than half of residents report experiencing serious financial problems, especially Black and Latinx individual. This study in July was conducted just as federal unemployment dollars were winding down. So the financial strain on families now especially low-income families and families of color, has only increased. Additionally, because of the good work of Columbus Public Health, we know that the infection rate in Columbus has been about four times higher for our Latinx residents and twice as high for Black residents when compared to white residents. I'd like to pause here to recognize Assistant Health Commissioner uh, Michael Fielding, um, whom you heard from in a prior ordinance. Mr. Fielding, uh, could you take a moment, please, to just share that demographic and zip code data 
data that CPH tracks, um, which helps us understand uh, where infections are, are prevalent and what kind of challenges our residents are facing. Sure. Uh, thank you, President Pro Tem Brown, uh, President Hardin, uh, Council Member Tyson, and other council members. As we all know, health disparities have existed for years uh, regarding chronic disease and other public health issues in our community. COVID-19, I was just mentioned, <clears throat> is no different. And I want like you to take a listen to or take a pause on these numbers here. So when you look at uh, celebrate one priority areas or zip codes in comparison to non-celebrate one uh, areas, um, taking the non-celebrate one areas, when you're looking at cases or the rate, rate per 100,000, the number in non-celebrate area is around 2,100 uh, cases. When you look at celebrate one priority areas, it's around 2,500 cases. These are approximate numbers. Certainly a disparity in the rate of uh, acquiring COVID-19. When you look at the hospitalization rate, when you look at non-celebrate one area, it's 125 per 100,000. When you look at the celebrate one priority areas, you're talking 256 hospitalizations per 100,000. Certainly a difference in the rate. And then when you look at the deaths associated with COVID-19, when you look at the non-celebrate one area, it's 50 per 100,000. When you look at the celebrate one area, it's 57 or actually 58 um, deaths per 100,000. So you can see there's a disparity. And I know um, we always appreciate the support from city council and Columbus Public Health is very proud to have dealt with health equity or health inequities, uh, health disparities in our community for a number of years. And we're proud that we're now kind of aligning some of our work through a new center for public health innovation. And the goal is to eliminate all health inequities and all health disparities as we move forward. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown. Thank you so much, Mr. Fielding. And I really appreciate the work of CPH. Um, we can't address issues if we don't track the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so much starts right there. Um, and you are a leader in that. So thank you to you and Dr. Roberts. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, easy to see the connection between the higher rates of infection and and the jobs the low the lower wage jobs that celebrate one zip code residents um, hold and that are disproportionately held by people of color jobs that largely require in-person work and also are least likely to offer paid time off. And all of this together creates an impossible decision for workers between protecting their health and protecting their income if they contract COVID-19. So in response to this reality that far too many of our residents are facing, we are introducing the Right to Recover initiative in partnership with Columbus Urban League and uh, Catholic Social Services. They joined us today to announce this proposal um, along with Dr. Daryl Gray um, of OSU. And uh, one of the things he reminded us, which is uh, really borne out in the numbers that you provided, Mr. Fielding, um, is how all of these other risk factors um, uh, for uh, chronic diseases, which worsen COVID-19, are already worse among populations of workers, uh, disproportionately workers of color, but populations of workers that make lower income live in environments that don't have as much access to clean air um, uh, and, and those sorts of things. So this work is all interconnected. Um, and we're glad to be partnering with the Urban League and Our Lady of Guadalupe Center because they have established relationships in the community that will ensure eligible workers know about the program and can participate in the program. Right to Recover will offer residents the financial resources they need to take time off of work and isolate um, and recover following a positive diagnosis. The program provides approximately two up to $15 an hour um, for households uh, uh, at 150% of the federal poverty line or below. 
the program importantly taps into $1.21 million uh, of federal CARES Act funding. Um, again, eligible residents must earn $150 percent or below of the federal poverty line. Um, and, and Federal CARES Act, Act funds expire on December 31st, which every member of this council is very aware, especially Council Member Tyson. Um, so we are aware um, that we need to you know, work hard to make sure that uh, residents can benefit from the program uh, for the time that we can deploy it. Because giving workers the security they need to get tested and follow safety recommendations protects their health and their family's health, but also the health of the broader community by reducing risk of spread. Uh, we're, we're prioritizing the economic security and health of our most vulnerable residents during the worst public health and economic crisis in living memory. I am very grateful to my council colleagues for their support. This simply would not have been possible without them. I'm grateful to our community partners, the Urban League and Guadalupe Center, who help us put people and families first as we continue to weather this storm together. I also wanna thank uh, Kelsey Ellingson on my team for her um, unbelievably dogged work in getting this done. Um, Matt Erickson and Seth Ferguson in the Legislative Research Office for their work um, in uh, helping design a program that can work in Columbus. Um, so with that, uh, Council Member Tyson, I, I will turn it back to you or take any, of course, questions or comments from colleagues. Well, President Pro and Brown, I will just state that um, this is an important initiative. And so, um, again, to ensure that individuals in our community that are affected or, can, or could be affect, could affected by COVID, that you mentioned are a lot of the essential workers, that this will certainly take some of the stress away from them as if they, um, as they move forward with um, the illness of COVID and be able to re recover, um, return to work without having to worry about about, about their finances. So this is great. This is this is an, a great service to the residents of our community. So thank you for this. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to President Pro Tem for your leadership on this important effort to support families uh, in literally the toughest of times. And thank you to the colleagues to support it. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favorite reading, <clears throat> Thompson, President Hart. Pass. Pass. Thank you. And the final ordinance in my committee this evening is ordinance number 2312-2020. That is to authorize the Columbus City Council to enter into a grant agreement with uh, a J. Drill, Jarrell Development Corporation in support of Kimball Farms COVID-19 Community Assistance Program and to authorize the transfer of appropriations and expenditures of $40,000 within CARES Act Fund and declare an emergency. I'm now going to turn the floor over to my council colleague, Council Member Mitchell Brown, to share information regarding this ordinance. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Chair Tyson. Uh, again, as you've already stated, um, this is a grant agreement with J. Jairus Development, a faith-based nonprofit organization located on the east side. JADC utilizes a holistic approach to serving individuals and families and responding to the needs of the community. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but it helps. This Kimball Farms COVID-19 Community Assistance Program will provide rental and or mortgage assistance to residents and small businesses in the Kimball Farms community. The funds will be utilized to pay up to $1,500 of delinquent rents and mortgages per applicant address. Funds can also be utilized to cover delinquent electric and or water charges if they are included as part of the monthly rental or mortgage. The objective is small people have needs like everybody else. If we can help them out, we should do so. I move for passage this legislation and I turn it back over to you, Council Chairman uh, Tyson. Councilman, you're still muted. Sorry. Thank you, Councilman Brown, and just really appreciate um, your efforts and all the efforts tonight of my council colleagues who are certainly um, supporting um, supporting our residents during this um, pandemic, and certainly 
um, it would be very difficult for our residents to be able to move forward without the support that we that have been passed tonight by um, my, I, my colleagues. So thank you so much for supporting the human service agencies as they support residents in our community. If there are no questions or comments regarding this legislation, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. That concludes um, all the legislation and health and human services this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further business to come before council, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. We have two non-agenda speakers. Um, the first uh, non-agenda.